Hello, this is Lauren Carr, and welcome to Authors on iTours, a podcast devoted to authors, book bloggers, and other book lovers alike. Today, we are excited to have Maggie Clare, a.k.a. Tabitha Lord. Maggie Clare is the pen name of award-winning speculative fiction author Tabitha Lord. When channeling Maggie, she writes all the naughty things. A lover of tea, chocolate, and yoga, she lives in Rhode Island with her husband and menagerie of fur babies. Everybody, you know, sit back and relax and enjoy. We are going to have a conversation with Tabitha Lord, aka Maggie Claire. So, uh, so Tabitha, hey, how are you? Thank I'm, you so much for coming today. I'm so pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, great. Now, we were talking before we started that, um, now if, if so people are probably going to notice that hey are you interviewing the right a right author because right. her name there is Tabitha Lord and the book on tour is uh, Moving Target by Maggie Claire so Tabitha why don't you straighten people out one <laughs> and the same do you have a dual personality I do I absolutely I have a dual personality no um I started off in my my writing journey as a speculative fiction writer and the first um thing I ever wrote was science fiction. I wrote a science fiction trilogy. I have a bunch of um, work out um, short fiction on podcasts and all kinds of speculative fiction. And the agent that I work with works with me as Tabitha. Um, and so that was my first platform, my first venture into the writing. Um, but during COVID, I kind of got this idea that I want to do something a little fun, a little something I could do more online, reach readers directly. And the romance genre is really excellent at that. And I do love reading romance. So I thought, I have some ideas. I, I could write a romantic suspense, I think. <laughs> and so I started building the new platform as Maggie Claire because there really are, it's a different audience. Some of my Maggie yeah. readers will go find me as Tabitha because they like my writing. But a lot of my science fiction hardcore folks aren't really going to make the transition into romance. So I, they're separate, but not hidden from one another. So, you know, Maggie knows about Tabitha. Tabitha knows about Maggie. All the readers know. But if you know that you're reading Tabitha, you know you're getting a certain thing. And if you know you're reading Maggie, you're getting something else. And the Maggie Claire name, when I started thinking about writing under a pen name, is actually at my grandmother's, my two grandmothers on my dad and my mom's side, Margaret and oh. Claire. And they both passed before I was published, uh, but oh. they were both avid readers. And I thought, oh, they'd love it if I gave them- Did they read, know, read romance or um, my, my one grandmother read romance, my other read the sci-fi book. Both would have been thrilled to be, you know, the, the name of the spicy stuff. They totally would have <laughs> thought that was hysterical. So yeah. that's my way of honoring them. <laughs> uh, yeah, you write naughty fiction to honor your grandmothers. So Absolutely. That, that's different. That's totally different. <laughs> Why is the name to honor them? No naughty fiction, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that seems like such different, you know, especially because with doing virtual book tours, you know, yeah. I, that, you know, I never seen the crossover. I would never ima imagine that a sci-fi author would be writing romantic suspense. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting because... I read so widely. I'm not just, as a reader, I don't just read in the sci-fi or the speculative fiction genre. I read widely. And I feel like you can recognize good storytelling in any genre. And so if my deepest uh, you know, purpose as a writer is to be a good storyteller, I feel like I can do that across different genres. I only categorize them this way only because the audience is looking for something particular. When they, when yes. they look at Tabitha, they're looking for something particular. When they're looking for Maggie, they're looking for something particular. So that's the only reason I really keep them separately. But I feel like some of the things in the romantic suspense, you know, when I'm doing world building and creating this epic sci-fi, you know, trilogy or whatever, there's a lot of action happening. And, you know, you're writing these action sequences and this high intensity stuff. And that's why I think I'm drawn to the suspense part of the romantic suspense, um, mm -hmm. because I do enjoy writing the action and I enjoy writing the suspense. Um, but I also love being able to more deeply explore the relationships that are romantic novel allows and is encouraged mm -hmm. to do and I love writing a happy ending and not everything on the other side gets a fully happy ending you know and here you, you get to write that happy ending and everybody goes away smiling you know no matter <laughs> if you put them through the ringer you know they're going to come out the other side smiling 
So We're it's not sort of satisfying. Mm. Yeah. Your, your, uh, it's Tactical Solutions. Yes, Tactical Solutions to... International is the name of the series. So all the books in the series are interrelated, but you don't have to read them in sequence. They are in a timeline, but each story is independent with a different couple. And I just sort of refer back to some of the other couples. So you get a little peek at what so-and-so is doing in this next book, but the story stands on its own. So if you found Moving Target, which is really the fourth book in the series, you wouldn't be at a disadvantage if that's the first one you read. You might be curious and say, oh, who is this person? I feel like they have their own story because they do, you know, and so you can go back and find that one. Um, well, now, the, who, now, who are the characters in that? So um, the characters are essentially, I had a, a couple of guys who ex-military started a, a, like a security firm that does, you know, um, security work or other kinds of military, paramilitary stuff, but in the private sector. And so there's the two partners and then their very first employee is, was Jake, who um, is in the first book, Sing For Me. And he gets, you know, really injured overseas and really goes through a bad time. And they kind of save him by giving him another job. And like, you know, you, you're a tech guy too. You can do this instead. And, and that sort of saves him. Um, and then the second one is, is um, somebody's brother that I pulled out of the... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like sometimes the characters that, you know, I had a, I had an original plan of five books and now it's going to be eight, I think, because there are two characters popped out that I never intended to write about and were so yeah, popular. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, yes. Moving Target is one of those. Moving Target, you meet Teague, the um, star of this, he's a drummer in a band. You meet him in book one. He's Fiona's drummer. She was the star of book one. And I'm like, people loved him so much. I'm like, I, I can make a story for Teague. I think I can do that. So, And, and you have a flip because you yes. have a bodyguard, but the yes. bodyguard is a woman. Yes. I, I wanted to not kind of, I wanted to kind of not keep sticking with the trope of the guy rescuing the girl, you know, uh, the, the male character rescuing, rescuing the female, which is so fun to work with. And I make my character sassy anyway. The girls kind of rescue themselves too, but um I wanted to just flip it on its head and, and make a really strong female character who's working in a male dominated world and still have her, you know, be a woman. Because I think we women are, are you know, it's not one or the other. You don't have to be a only feminine damsel in distress. You can be a female character that's super strong and still be, you know, fall in love and still have desires. And she, are, fought, and she is guarding the guy. She's guarding him, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What well, now? Now tell t what. What is okay? Why don't you tell what is Moving Target about? Because you know we've already said a little bit. <laughs> yep. So Maria, um, the the female character, she works for TSI. She's one of their employees. She's ex military. She's an ex marine. Um, she loves her new job working with them. She's been with them a couple of years. We meet her in the book before because she's um, helping with the security detail of one of the other characters. So we get a little glimpse of her. Um, and then Tegan is a drummer in a, in a rock band. And we met him in book one because he was the drummer for the band there. And he needs security. You know, they're going on tour and he needs security. And Maria, he has a crush on Maria. He's the one that's going after her, but he's been portrayed as such a player, which he is. But he's like, it's getting old. I really do want something real. And this woman is intriguing to me. I, I'm getting to know her over time and I really like her, but she will not pay him any mind. First, she doesn't want to... Um, you know, she doesn't want to put her career in jeopardy and do, you know, have an affair with a client. Essentially, she's got integrity. She doesn't want to do that. He respects that. He's like, how about when this gig is done, we get together and she's still like, nope, you're a player. I don't trust your kind, you know, your type. So she totally puts him in a box, isn't willing to look further than just, you know, his outrageous behavior with the women while he's, you know, whatever. So, um, so he's been trying to get at her. The opening scene though, is he's, he gets shot. He's the witness to um, a cartel murder. Um, and he, he's the sole surviving witness. So the women are killed and he's the only one left alive and he's very injured. And so Maria has, they have to go on the run because the person that did the killing has left a witness and now knows it. So that's the moving target piece. Well, that's kind of the premise. And of mm. course, you know, sparks fly and <laughs> all is well in the end, of course, cause it's a romance, but it was really fun to write. I love his personality. He's Australian. And so my sister lived for many years in Australia on and off. And so I would, I read the whole thing out loud to her when we were vacationing together over the summer, early in the summer. And, um, and I, she, you know, I said, did I get it right? You know, am I using the right terms and the right phrases and that sort of thing? She's <laughs> like, this is great. I love Teague. He's fabulous. I'm like, I love him too. So, so you actually started this. Uh, so this is book, is this book four or five? Four. Yep. This is book four and you're going to have eight. 
Uh, so in how long does it take you to write one of these? These only take me about three months to write. My big sci-fi books take me almost nine months, you know, six to nine months to write and then a bit longer to edit. I do more developmental edits with the sci-fi ones because they're more plot heavy. And so sometimes, you know, I've written myself into a tangle and I've got to come out, but it's not really working. So I have to go back in and muck with it or I didn't develop a character correctly over, you know, the expanse of this big thing that's happening. So they take longer. These books, I tend to outline the pretty much the story ahead of time for these. Like I sit and I really think about, you know, who are the, who's the couple, what's their history, you know, what's going to be the main suspenseful part of the story. And I get that all um, kind of nailed down before I start writing so that I can write these a little bit faster. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I don't have to do as much developmental editing when that's done. You know, I can mostly go through and be like, ah, that didn't work. I do do it, but it's not as, um, I don't have to rip apart the whole plot and put it back together again for these usually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because these are supposed to be really escapist reads. Right. You know, they, they, you know, uh, you know, just a little, you call them a little bit naughty. Naughty. <laughs> no, I, no, no, and I, ha I have, uh, uh, you know, friends who are uh, romantic suspense authors. Can you tell, you know, so I, so I know the answer to this, but, but, you know, but if you could tell people who are watching, there's a difference between romantic suspense and erotica. Yes. And your books are not erotic. No, they're not erotic. I and I think I, some people, they, they automatically assume that, you know, right. but that, that they're one and the same, but they're not. What, what's no. the difference? Between well, your I would say even amongst romance novels, you have all these subgenres, you know, so the romantic suspense, in my opinion, is, you know, got, has the element of that plot, that suspenseful plot line. You know, I've got stalkers, I've got killers on the run, I've got serial killers, you know, and so there's some kind of suspenseful plot that's sort of the background of the thing but the front and center is the relationship between the two characters and them finding their way to each other or coming back to one another or whatever trope you're using for the romance so that's going along and and you can decide i think in any in any one of these romance genres like contemporary romance or suspense or whatever romantic comedy how much heat you want to put in and i don't think there's a right answer to that i think it's just a matter of what feels right to the author what feels right for the series that you're mm -hmm. developing. I put a considerable amount of heat in most of them. This one actually has the least amount because Teague is injured for a long time. So they can't, they can't get it on for a while, <laughs> right? So <laughs> yeah. I have to be a little creative about that. And then it also isn't as steamy, but some of the other ones I do put the, the heat in and the bedroom door is wide open and I'm pretty descriptive. However, those sexy scenes serve the story. They're not the story. And I think with erotica, you're, you're, you're making almost the sexual uh, content is the story, you know, um, and maybe there's something else running in the background, but people are really reading it for that, for those scenes, you know, and mm. here they might be like turning the page to these scenes, but they're also invested in the character development, invested in the, you know, whatever plot line is running in the background and that sort of thing. So again, I could have shut the bedroom door at, at every time that they, the characters go off and just alluded to what they were doing. But I find that writing a good sex scene often illustrates something about the characters. You know, do they have a, um, a hidden uh, fear? Do they, are you, are you showing them at their most vulnerable? What, you can learn things even through these kinds of scenes, you know, so, mm -hmm. or the payout, like they've been waiting and waiting and waiting and you want to give the reader a little bit of a, you know, a, a glimpse into the, yay, they finally did it. So I feel like that's, um, I like writing the steam, but I also put it in balance with the story. And I don't write gratuitous sex scenes. I write them when they are fitting for the story and they're going to illuminate something about the characters and show the reader something as well as kind of be like, Ooh, that was fun to read. You know? <laughs> Whereas the erotica, I think, you know, is really, you're there for the good stuff. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Does that and, make sense? You know, in other words, the, the, the sex scenes move the plot forward. Right. You know, where with romantic, you know, the, the romantic suspense plot, whereas erotica, it doesn't, the whole thing's about the, the right. sex, right. Is which the is fun in and of itself, but it isn't, you know, necessarily like, again, I could have toned down um, the sex scenes in some of the books and, and, and I don't think you would have lost too much. Although I, I do feel like sometimes when you get to see that glimpse of the characters at their most vulnerable or most intimate, you learn something about them it does add depth. So, um, and they're fun to write. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> do you 
they test them out at home? Yeah. Like, um, hey, honey, here's your here's your scene. Let's practice. <laughs> Let's see if this will happen. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I saw an interview with one uh, erotica author who. You know, well, let's see what it's like to do it on top of the dryer while the dryer is running. <laughs> you know, we got to test this out, husband. Might not <laughs> work that well. <laughs> That's your right off or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I, my luck, I'd end up in the emergency room. I know, right? I broke something. I fell. That's it. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Now you, and you know, now. Now you were talking about that you that you write speculative fiction, and that may be a new term for some people who are watching this. You said at the beginning of the interview, um, you know. So I want I'm swinging back to that. Sure. What what is speculative fiction? Because you did say that it is uh, that you write sci-fi, but is speculative mm -hmm. sci-fi and it includes and what anything sci-fi. Do you write? Because well, that's a lot of questions. Okay, Hang that's on. a lot of all questions. Right, yeah, right, tell so. us about your your speculative okay. fiction. <laughs> So speculative fiction, um, it, I think it encompasses all of the, the sci-fi fantasy, urban fantasy, anything that has either that uh, futuristic or supernatural elements to it. So it's that speculative piece, like where it's not, it's not grounded in the real world necessarily entirely. Okay. It's right? not so if you add an element of magic, you can call it speculative. You'll call it fantasy if it's got magic and dragons and things, but it, that will still fall under that banner. Speculative okay. is just, you know, like... Uh, yeah, anything that's not grounded fully in reality is how I think of it, which is why any of the stuff that I write under Tabitha, you know, is the sci-fi. Um, I have an urban fantasy that's on submission right now with my agent. I have the, um, the short fiction that I've written. I've written some horror. I've written some hardcore sci-fi. I've written some, um, some fantasy also. And so I kind of like... I grew up. Oh, even you though write they're a lot different. of stuff. You yeah. write all different stuff. I yeah. do. And even though they're different from one another, I feel like any of those kinds of things that has that element of not grounded in reality necessarily can go under that banner. So Tabitha writes that, you know, so. Oh, okay. I know. All right. right. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So what kind of science fiction do you write? But then that, that was why I was, because I've, I've had authors come, come for tours who say, I write sci-fi. Mm -hmm. And I find some do well with my my readers, my bloggers. Some don't. Uh, one that doesn't sure. do is the sci-fi that's out in another planet. <laughs> you know, if it's yeah. out in space, I find it doesn't do well at all. You know, people have their things. So I write space opera, which is sort of I don't want to say sci-fi light because I do have spaceships and other planets and things like that. But it's grounded in um, the characters. Still, it's still character driven. Um, it's an epic story of a, a, um, my premise was what if on a distant world that had been isolated from the rest of the colonies uh, for a long time, some of the population evolved differently from their neighbors and could do things with their mind. And so they're telepaths and empaths. And of course, the people that are not gifted are very afraid of their neighbors. And so they do what humans do and they go in and invade um, and they nearly uh -huh. wipe out the gifted people. So my main character, when you meet her, she's on the run. She's from this hidden camp. Um, she survived the genocide and a ship crashes and she witnesses it and she's an empath and a telepath so she feels the pilot suffering she saves him um and realizes he's not from her world and in fact her world was once part of this other you know so there's this local politics thing going on that feels a lot like a world war ii resistance movement set in space you know it's just set on a bigger yeah. canvas set on a planet yeah. that's different than ours uh -huh. but it feels that very gritty down to earth we're trying to save our people and there's the you know the resistance fighters that are from the other side that are not gifted that have still joined forces because they want to throw overthrow the dictator kind of thing and then there's this bigger you know like bigger picture thing where this little colony that has you know kind of evolved very differently and has all this own was once part of something bigger and now they're going they're looped back in they're getting pulled back into it so um and it's a three book series and it won a bunch of awards which was sort of Ooh, cool you, what's the name of it? you haven't mentioned it the name it's called <laughs> Her, it's the horizon trilogy so it's horizon infinity and equinox and horizon oh. was my debut novel and it won the writer's digest grand prize in 2016 so that was really exciting oh, oh okay yeah. So. Yeah. Now, how did you come up with that idea? Because yeah, were you a right? sci-fi fan, or yes. it, you, what you're talking about is, yeah, it's in another world, but it's but, a human story. It doesn't sound like there's. Yeah, it sounds like it's, it's a human it's story. Human dri character driven. Totally. I like character driven stuff. Um, I came up with that. I had that idea of 
I was just playing around with that idea of what, what would the next step in human evolution look like? What if we did, what, what if we could do things with our mind? What would that look like? And then I got the idea, well, what if only part of the population could do it? So that was the premise that I started on thematically. Um, and I was also toying with the questions of like, what do people do under such duress? You know, when your whole culture has either been wiped out or you're, uh, you know, you're just fighting to survive, who who stands and fights and who runs and hides and who turns in their neighbors? Like it really had that, you know, underground resistance flavor to it. Um, mm -hmm. And then the main character, I just sort of thought, what if she was one of those people? And it just kind of came together. And then separately, I had this snippet of an image of the, the opening scene with the ship crashing and her finding it. And I was like, I married those two together. Like, what would happen? <laughs> So, and, and how long did it take you to write that first book? Oh, that took a while. Um, the first draft, <laughs> the first draft took nine months to write, and then I I edited it for almost two years because it was my first book. So I really didn't understand a lot about storytelling craft. You know, like what's pacing? What does that mean? And character development and you know I got the story out, so that was really good. But then I had to spend a lot of time learning how to be a writer. <laughs> You know. Okay, and you have now you you it's a trilogy, so you yep. have the second and third book out now. They are out now. Yep. So that's mm -hmm. finished. I've also written short fiction, uh, about six short stories that I've sold into the market. Some are um, on podcasts, others are in anthologies that you know. So they're just they're out there, and they've been like I said, I did wrote two horror stories, which I'm not a horror writer, but I had these ideas, and I'm like, this will be a good medium to do it, so I don't have to create a whole book, um, and then. I have one more hardcore sci-fi when it's an exploratory, you know, if Earth was dead and we had to go out and uh, find a new home, what would that look like? Uh, so that was fun. That's been sold a couple of times, actually, because you get the rights back quickly with short stories. And so <laughs> other people buy it and put it in their, you know, magazines or anthologies. And then I had a high fantasy that I wrote. I was a classics major, so studied Latin and Greek and, and mythology. And I always wanted to write... Um, the, the homecoming, Odysseus's homecoming story from Penelope's point of view. And so I just took that one moment in time in the Odyssey um, and created his homecoming from her perspective. And it was, it, it got, that was the first thing I ever sold. It got published in an anthology called Sirens um, uh -huh. by World Weaver Press. So that was fun. Mm -hmm. what, what's the challenges between because you know it, you, your science fiction, your speculative fiction, you say takes longer to write than the romantic suspense. What's the difference in your writing style? Do you have to change your writing because you you actually have a different pen name? I do. It, I think it, it's you know. an, interesting because I've been um, I was the managing editor for a couple of years for the Inkit Writers Blog, and Inkit's a, a publishing house based out of Berlin, and I and I wrote a lot of writing craft articles, and I thought a lot about what is the writer's voice versus the character's voice versus, you know, and I've come to the fact that I think that you can recognize me, the writer, in, in stylistically somehow in all of my things, even if I'm holding a different character's voice or telling a different story. I think there's this nugget that doesn't really um, mm -hmm. change all that much that with all our favorite writers, no matter what they're writing, we're like, oh yeah, it still feels like so-and-so, even if they're writing something different. So I mm -hmm. think yeah. I still, I think I have that. It's pretty established, um, but I, I do tend to write um, to try to really, from whatever character's perspective I'm telling the story from, and I don't write a lot of first person. I usually do third person limited, so a tight for third person, but third person. Um, but I try to really get into their head, you know, and really yeah. get into their mm -hmm. personality. Um, so it's the same if I'm, do, for the character stuff, it's the same if I'm writing the sci-fi and fantasy and the and the and the um, romantic suspense because I'm trying to get into the head of that character um, mm -hmm. but I, I do think that there's a different feel to the books though like if you were to yeah. read the sci-fi books you'd be like this is a much more epic plot line this is a much more detailed world building you know like imagination happening behind there so I think you would sense that difference um you know mm -hmm. but... what are you working on next so I have another uh, book that's completed that's with my agent and it's called um, Dream Walker and it's kind of loosely a, an urban fantasy. It feels a bit like Dexter meets um, Elizabeth Salinger from the Dragon Tattoo books. She's a techie person but she's also an assassin and she uh, is a vigilante assassin but kills you in your sleep because she's a dream <laughs> oh. so She takes her jobs off the dark web. Only bad guys 
you know, but so she's like cartel people want to knock off somebody else or people that have gotten away with things. And she's, she's the, she brings justice. And the opening scene is she's in someone's head and it's a job. She's supposed to be killing this guy. And um, she realizes he's not bad. Like she can get that sense when she's in there tooling around in their brains. And she's like, uh oh, he's a boy scout. Like he's not, but he's like, he feels clean and not so she doesn't do the job. And so she investigates in the real world and realizes he's an FBI agent undercover and someone put a hit out on him. So now she's conflicted because she's, you know, she does have a moral code. I don't want him to die. He's an FBI agent, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I also don't want to blow my own cover and be like, yes, and I was going to kill you. But so that's the premise of that book. And that's out on submission right now with my agent, meaning she's trying to sell it into the bigger market. Mm -hmm. And then I've got the next book. So, for, um, and this is in the real world. This is not on another planet. Not on another planet, but again, it has that speculative element because she's a dreamwalker. So she kills you in your sleep, which is not yep. something I don't think people can do in this world. Let <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, me find out. You never know. <laughs> but I, you know, I had that thought about, you know how there's that urban fantasy or that urban legend that if you die in your sleep, like if you actually hit the ground when you fall off the building, that you would die. Like, you know, yeah, you've heard that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Closet, though, right? Like, yeah. So she's able to hold you in your dream and make the kill so that your body essentially thinks you died and does and you died in your sleep and you died in your sleep so it's clean and there's no mess and there's no evidence and so she gets paid in um you know virtual currency like bitcoin or um crypto mm -hmm. and so everything and she is by day she's like that elizabeth salinger techie you know she works for a um you know a real corporation that does you know um encryption and things like that so that's her world uh, so that's fun. I, it was a really fun book to write, and I'm hoping that soon I will have the it end, sold. Again. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And um, and then it, for the in the TSI world, the next book coming is if anybody's read all the books, they'll know it's it's going to be AJ's story. So if, if you know who AJ is, he's one of the partners. Um, and uh -huh. I've been sort of leading up to the fact that his wife has been very sick all this time. She's had cancer back and forth, back and forth. So finally, it's going to be a second chance romance for him. I'm not uh -huh. sure yet what the suspense part's going to be yet, but no, I've got plenty to work with there. Yeah, I, I'm never short on ideas <laughs> of, of that sort of thing. So, And then I'm working on a story on Kindle Vela, which is the episodic, you know, are you feeling yeah, with the Vela yeah. platform? As Maggie, yeah, I haven't had the guts to try that. Yeah, it's, um, I just thought, why not? I'll give it a whirl. It's another platform. So I'm about three quarters of the way through the story that I'm writing episodically. It's a little darker. It's a little more erotic, but dark. Um, but it does come under my Maggie. So I'm writing it as Maggie. If you enjoyed this interview, then do be sure to give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to receive notifications for future author interviews. Until next time, happy reading from Authors on iTours.